You're a historian. I'm a political philosopher. We're creatures of the academy, Yuval, at least initially. And yet now you, you've written a graphic history. You've turned sapiens into a graphic history with pictures. Now, that's a, that's a kind of departure from an academic uh, project. And I've been uh, accused of trying to make uh, political philosophy accessible beyond the bounds of the academy. How do you think about this project, about the relation between the academy and everyday life? Uh, who do you see as the audience of the, the graph sapiens of graphic history? I would say that maybe this is a populist science, that this is, uh, uh, at essence, a, a populist project of going beyond or through this kind of meritocratic or academic divide that I, I think it's very dangerous on a number of levels to keep science confined to a small academic elite or to any kind of elite. I think it's, it's unjustified. It, it creates wrong impressions. Um, I think the latest scientific findings in most areas should be accessible to everyone, uh, both as a project of enlightenment and also as a political project, because more and more of the main political controversies of the 21st century revolve around scientific fields. We saw it already with climate change that began as a scientific theory and was uh, politicized. We see it now with COVID-19, when like almost everybody now has a degree in epidemiology, or at least think they have a degree in epidemiology. We'll see it with other, other fields like artificial intelligence, that they will become increasingly politicized. And if you have this notion, this technocratic notion, that only epidemiologists know something about epidemics. They should solve this matter by themselves. Only economists understand economics. Only climate scientists understand climate. And only uh, 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 computer scientists understand artificial intelligence. That's extremely dangerous. Both because, yeah, maybe they understand the subject, but they don't bring a representative view of human interest into the debate. And also because if you shut out most people from the conversation, saying to them, no, that's too complicated for you to understand, then that's the fertile space, that's the vacuum, which all kinds of conspiracy theories and disinformation is, is then, then feels. I think that most of these subjects need to be confined to a small number of people. Maybe some academic subjects really are so complicated that most people can't understand them. Like, I don't know, uh, uh, quantum mechanics. I don't understand it. I think most people don't understand it. You need very high levels of mathematics to grasp it. Maybe this is an exception. But economics and history and climate and diseases, you should be able, you can understand the basic facts of science without a degree. But for that, the people who are kind of keeping, are the guardians of this knowledge, they need to make an effort. They need to make an effort to reach a broader audience. And for that, they need to sometimes change the way they speak or write. When you talk with other professionals in your narrow field, then you speak your professional jargon. And in many cases, you talk in numbers and statistics and models that most people don't understand. Even most academics outside your field don't understand them. When I read a professional article paper in macroeconomics or in climate science, I can't follow it. I can't understand it. But I think that the key ideas and insights which are important to have a public conversation about it, 
they can make the effort to make it accessible. And that's part of my project as a historian to translate the latest scientific findings and theories to a medium and to a language that everybody can understand. You don't need a, a, a PhD or a, a, a BA degree to, to follow that. And, you know, because most people think in stories, then I focus on storytelling. And in the new project, the graphic novel, I try to switch to a new medium of images, which many people find easier to understand and easier to connect with than just words. Even if you write in a very accessible style, still, reading a 500 pages book of mostly just words with footnotes, that's, that's a tall order for many people. So I now tried to translate this into the language of graphic novels and comics, but without looking down at people, without simplifying the ideas. In many ways, I think the graphic novel is even deeper than the original version of Sapiens. It's certainly not Sapiens with illustrations on the side. It's a completely new approach to how to tell science, which might not be um, to, the, to the liking of uh, some professors and academics, but I think it doesn't sell science short. There are actually a lot of new questions, scientific questions, that I had to engage with when creating this graphic novel together with Danielle and David. Again, I couldn't do it myself. I don't know how to draw. So I teamed up with two artists to do it. And it raised a lot of new scientific questions that previously I, I, I simply ignored. You know, words can often be abstract. You can talk in abstractions. When you draw images, you have to be concrete. There is no such thing as, almost no such thing, as abstract images. If I talk about um, sapiens and Neanderthals having sex, and I write about it in words, I can just write, okay, we know that 50,000 years ago, some sapiens had sex with Neanderthals and even produced babies together. When, when you draw that, you have to decide what to draw. Is it a sapiens man with a Neanderthal woman? Is it a sapiens woman with a Neanderthal man? Maybe it's two men having gay sex 50,000 years ago, sapiens and Neanderthals. You have to decide. And similarly, you have to decide what's their skin color, what's their hair color. And all these return you to the scientific research to look for answers. So I think that making the effort to reach out to a broader audience is not undermining the deep values of science. It's actually... Um, uh, uh, serving it in a right. much better way than just confining the discussion to a few PhD students or professors in, in, in a closed room.